That's good. So welcome uh, to all of you for um, this Thursday session. Following on from everything we talked about yesterday on um, uh, satellite altimetry missions, uh, I'm um, very happy to present to you the work we're doing on the future mission for SWAT. SWAT stands for Surface Water Ocean Topography. And uh, the SWAT mission follows on, as you can see, from a long line of uh, collaboration uh, between Kness and NASA, uh, originally for Topex and then the JSON series. Um, I forgot to mention yesterday that the upcoming reference mission uh, it, that we launched, this says 2018, it's an old slide, it's probably 2020, 21 now, is a JSON CS, con Continuity of Service, and it will also be a full SAR mission over the globe. So we're passing from uh, the low resolution mode up till now to a full SAR mode even for the climate missions. And SWAT is another technological uh, uh, revolution in using not just SAR in the long track direction, but SAR interferometry, and I'll explain what that is, um, to get uh, a wide swath coverage of the sea surface height over the ocean. So the oceanographic objectives of SWAT, uh, the primary objective is to try and get a two-dimensional sea surface height coverage down to uh, wavelength scales of about 15 kilometres and to better characterise this interaction between the mesoscale and the submesoscale uh, circulation, at least down to scales of about 15 kilometres. And as uh, Baylor explained so well uh, at the beginning of the, the week, it's really important, uh, the sub-mesoscales uh, for many different processes, and it provides a kind of missing link for climate studies to understand uh, and observe, um, monitor these interactions between the meso- and sub-mesoscales. And just to recall, as I said yesterday, 15 kilometres um, wavelength is uh, around about a 7 uh, kilometre diameter eddy or feature. A secondary part of SWAT is that we've done a lot of work on the orbit to make sure that we get a very good characterization of the ocean tides. And so I'll talk more about that too, but to look at coastal tides, high latitude tides, and uh, get global coverage of the internal tide signal, at least the coherent part, and then look at how that impacts the ocean's energy budget. So um, this is a nice schematic that's put out by JAMSTEC that uh, gives some idea in the Kurashio current of the importance of the uh, mesoscale and the submesoscale processes. So uh, in summer, you can see that uh, it's mainly the mesoscale processes that are dominating, uh, and the mixed layer is quite shallow. And uh, as mentioned earlier as well, these mesoscale processes are like flat disks with their large horizontal ratio, very small vertical ratio. And so they play a very strong role in the horizontal transport of all the different traces, and in particular heat, carbon, nutrients that are so important um, for the climate and for the biomass. In winter, when you get very deep mixed layers at these um, mid-latitudes, there's a lot of mixed layer instabilities that develop, a lot more sub-mesoscale structures. And uh, as Baylor also said, um, neurochemical models are showing that these are probably represent um, uh, responsible for about 50% of the vertical velocities. So the exchange of heat carbon from the surface layer into the deep ocean and also the vertical exchange of nutrients. So if we want to try and understand the interaction between the mesoscales and all the different uh, types of instabilities you can have at different periods of the year in different uh, situations, uh, the main questions we want to ask with SWOT are how observable are these processes with sea surface height? Uh, and also um, the relationship between uh, what we measure right at the surface from mixed layer processes and from other satellite observations of temperature, salinity, uh, etc. And what altimetry sees as sea surface height, because it will always be an integrated quantity. So it's not just what's happening in the mixed layer, it's what's happening in the mixed layer plus the rest. And so uh, that interaction is something that we can really access with altimetry. Um, and then one of the key things is also uh, what impact that has on the cascade of 
scales between the large and the mesoscales, and we can see that with wave number spectra. So this is a plot that's put out by um, some work by Sasaski et al. in 2013. And what's shown on the top is relative vorticity in the surface layer. So that's the, um, the gradient of the velocity, which is the gradient of the sea surface height. So it's, it's essentially the Laplacian of the sea surface height. And you can really see the difference between the summer and the winter uh, snapshot here of relative vorticity with a real soup of very small structures that are seen in winter and much more of the sort of larger scale mesoscale structures in summer. The bottom is a cut through here at 155 degrees um, east showing vertical velocities. So the colour is vertical velocities, red is positive, uh, blue is negative, and you see these chimneys of water being exchanged. Uh, green is the surface mixed layer, and you can see in summer there's hardly any activity in the surface mixed layer, all the activity is below, whereas in winter the surface mixed layer is much deeper, and you get this uh, very strong vertical velocities occurring within the surface mix layer, but also continuing down deeper into the ocean. So if we think of sea surface height integrating everything, we will be picking up all of these signals that are, that are uh, at very fine scales. So a follow-up study for this also looked at uh, the temporal evolution of kinetic energy, and they did this in an interesting way. They split up the kinetic energy that is less than 200 kilometres, which is shown in black, from the kinetic energy, which is uh, greater than two, well, two, between two and 300 kilometres, so essentially the larger mesoscale it is in this region. And you can see that the phasing is completely different. The smaller scale structures in the Kurashio have uh, larger amplitudes in March, April, May, like in midwinter. And then when you get to the larger mesoscales, they're starting to peak at the end of that period, towards May, June, July. And uh, they've done energy analyses, and they've shown that there is actually a transfer of energy between these small scales and the larger mesoscales. And so one's feeding up to the other at the end of the winter period. And you could sort of see that with the injection as well into the deeper layers and then um, uh, passing to larger scale features. So the key part here is that our current maps of altimetry with a viso are only seeing uh, the red curves. So larger air eddies sort of spontaneously occur in, Mar in May, June, July, but we can't see and we can't observe this whole generation process from the smaller feeding up to the large scale. And at the same time, we can't really observe the dissipation process or the cascade of energies to smaller scales. Even though with SWAT we won't get smaller than 15 kilometres, this is an important uh, exchange that we really need to better understand. As I said, SWAT will also um, give us important um, new observations right up to the coast. I'll explain exactly what it'll give uh, in a couple of minutes, but we'll essentially have 250 kilometre uh, pixels that we'll average into one kilometre square pixels, or two kilometres. And uh, you can see that this is relative vorticity in winter. These same processes, small-scale processes, also occur very actively in the coastal zone. But in addition, we have a lot of information and uh, exchange coming out of rivers. There's a lot of very active shelf processes, and we need to have altimetric observations that, um, that can capture that. So SWAT will enable us to approach right up to the coast and will be able to also uh, give us information in the estuary zones for river levels um, in the estuary zones. So as I mentioned yesterday, today's altimetric uh, constellation have a trouble observing these wintertime very fine scales because there's a lot of it that's left than the 70 kilometre noise level from Jason, for example, but also because the noise is higher in winter because of the extreme wave conditions and, just, and it's lower in summer. So in a sense, the intersection between the uh, 
the spectral cascade and the noise level would allow us to see smaller scales in summer, but we actually need to see smaller scales in winter. So SWAT will have more than an order of magnitude lower noise than, um, than uh, JSON, and uh, it will allow us to look on average uh, at, uh, at these much smaller scales. Though our analyses, it will still be affected a little bit by waves, and so we should have a little bit more um, error in the, uh, thank you, in the, um, in the winter time, but it will be uh, much, much smaller than what we can see today. So a final point, when um, this is work by uh, Clement Nubelman and Li Fu, where they took a numerical model and they analyzed for all the different space scales, what are the temporal scales associated? And uh, essentially what they found is that the decorrelation time uh, cascades like this is a function of space. So when you're looking at larger mesoscale features, then uh, they essentially have slower time scales. And you know that if you're looking at maps of these larger eddies, they, they move slowly across the ocean. And so uh, for something that's larger than about 200 kilometers, on general, they have a, like a 15-day decorrelation scale. And that's very well suited to what goes into the altimetry maps from a Viso today. 15-day decorrelation scales, 200 kilometer Gaussian decorrelation scales. We're capturing very well this part of the, um, the variability. SWAT, we have an extra challenge, and in fact, all of our observing systems, when you come down to these small scale features, have an extra challenge, as the temporal decorrelation is very small. And so altimetry, as I said yesterday, gives you a snapshot of this. SWAT will provide a two-dimensional snapshot, but uh, we'll need to have maybe 10 SWATs to do the temporal evolution. So we have to have a more um, uh, interesting or different ways of uh, looking at the temporal evolution. At least we'll be able to characterize their spatial, spatial distribution. So, um, to get down to these scales, we need, uh, and in particular in two dimensionals, we need a technological change so that the uh, um, noise levels can be moved down to a much smaller scale. And for that, we're going to use um, a technique, which is SAR interferometry. And so the SWAT mission uh, has a lot of uh, heritage. Uh, there's a version of this that flew on the space shuttle back in the 1970s, and it's actually in the um, museum in uh, Washington. If you go to the, the um, Aerospace Museum near the airport in Washington, you can see the space shuttle uh, SWAT, well, version of SWAT, SRTM. Quite a neat. Um, and SWAT will have two SAR uh, altimeters either side of this long 10 meter beam, and they'll use interferometric techniques to give a uh, two dimensional view. SWAT brings together two communities the hydrological community, who are very interested in measuring the smallest rivers and lakes, and the ocean community, who want to really access these uh, small um, sub mesoscale or small mesoscale structures. So the SWAS are about 60 kilometers wide. They will have um, uh, producing SAR images over each side, plus co-located heights. So you can use the images to, to, to look at fronts and the co-located heights to give you the actual height information. It has a very high intrinsic resolution. I'll come back to this. Over the land, um, this will be downloaded everywhere. Uh, and including a very small coastal zone of about three kilometers around all the coasts. But it generates roughly, at the highest resolution, about eight teraoctet of data per day. And so it's impossible at the moment to bring all that data down. And so uh, over the oceans, to reduce the noise, we are doing onboard processing and downloading data uh, and interferograms at a 250 meter um, average, and then they will be averaged again to give us like one to two kilometer grid cells. But the key point is that this interferometric technique reduces the noise, and uh, we're about a 2.5, 2.4 centimeter squared 
per square kilometre noise level, today's altimeters have that averaged over the globe. So we're looking at something that is a really very, very small um, uh, noise compared to what we have today. The there's a NADAR altimeter, uh, standard NADAR altimeter in the gap between the two tracks. So it's due to be launched in October 2020. It has an inclination to 78 degrees, which means we cover in latitude to 78 degrees north and 78 degrees south. So I'd just like to show this um, animation. And I um, firstly would just like to apologize because these animations have been made for the Kness by a private uh, company. And I'm allowed to use them for lectures, but I can't leave them with you, and they won't be on the video. So I apologize. They're just as illustrations. The main information's in the rest of the slides. So um, you're probably all aware of the principles of interferometry, because it's been around a long time, for land movement. So you have a SAR satellite that comes past at one time, another satellite that comes past at another time. They me measure these big slopes in the land, and they put this sort of interferometric image. So you've seen this for subsidence or for volcanic cones coming out, etc. It's something that people have been working on for a long time. So in terms of what we spoke about yesterday, I was talking about the fact that at NADAR, we are limited by the footprint, and so our ground resolution is uh, limited by this uh, footprint size. The wide swath altimeter is not looking at NADAR directly down. It's looking at an angle at about four degrees um, to the side. And as the pulse comes down, you can see the first part will be reflected from here, the second from here. You measure the timing, and uh, there, are, there is a return that happens at slightly different times right across that swath. And so the ground resolution here is the limit of the difference in time between our pulses coming down. And that's why you can get a ground resolution that's around uh, uh, 70 kilometers, sorry, 70 meters to 10 meters across the track. And it's much, much smaller than the average that comes back from a pulse uh, limited altimetry, as we have with um, uh, Saral or um, Jason. So it's a very, very fine ground resolution across track because of this. And there's SAR processing from the movement of the satellite along track. So we get very fine resolution along track from the SAR processing, very fine resolution cross track from the interferometric processing. And uh, so just to reinforce that, with the averaging on board, we get a data volume of one teraoctet per day. And the uh, measurement is made by sending out an impulsion towards the ground. It gets the return at this very fine resolution back to the same place that sent out the signal. But it's also captured by the other uh, antenna. And so you get uh, two antennas measuring the back return and then recreating an interferogram at the, at the bottom. And so... Um, Just another, sorry, I can't see the screen. <laughs> so just to explain uh, this part, there's one impulse that comes down from here, and then that's returned to both. Then there's another impulse that comes down on this side, and it's captured by both. And then it does ping pong. So as it sets out uh, between the near range and the far range, we get this swath, it goes right into the coastal zone, it covers our lakes and rivers at very fine resolution, and as I said, within about three kilometres, we have the low resolution mode, onboard averaged ocean mode, but we also have an additional very high resolution uh, mode right close to the coast. So the basics of this, Pierre-Yves explained the basics of the pulse um, limited um, uh, altimetry. The basics of this radar are quite similar. Um, you measure the range coming back at both sides of the, um, this long beam, which is uh, the mast has a, a baseline of about 10 metres. Um, so you can measure the height, 
knowing the angle that you're looking at. And in fact, you can get the angle from the distance, uh, the, the return, uh, the difference between uh, the range measured at each side of the mast. And the phase gives us the very important information about uh, uh, the contours of topography that we're going to be seeing. And so the phase can be um, also derived if we know the wavelength of our signal and uh, from this difference. The phase, the interferograms you see is like this series of um, contours. And uh, for SWOT, we will also have these sorts of, of contours. And there's a 2 pi um, ambiguity in not really under knowing the absolute level of the sea surface height. And so you have to do what they call a phase unwrapping to uh, come down and find the absolute phase that we can then use to calculate the height. So my final animation explains that perhaps uh, a bit better. So this is um, the satellite going round at a distance uh, above, the, above the Earth, above the reference ellipsoid. It's sending down two uh, measurements either side as it goes along its uh, ground track, and it measures the return signal from both. So on a wavy surface, you'll have the height of the ocean going up and down. The return uh, level will also be going up and down to both satellites. And using this information, we can find the height, uh, the absolute height, as it uh, changes. So this is what I was saying about the phase. The phase goes down from both sides. It's measured at the first part. It's measured at the second part, but you can see the clock's gone round uh, perhaps one or two times. So you have this phase difference, which will give us very important information about the height, but it will have this 2 pi ambiguity. And so, in general, we, we clamp these measurements down to a um, surface, the mean sea surface, for example, and the phase... Uh, ambiguity can be taken out with an error of plus or minus one metre on the mean sea surface. So we have, uh, we have uh, a good handle that we know our mean sea surface better than one metre, and we can use that to help us correct for the, the phase difference. So what does, what's actually captured back on board? On each side of the boom, you'll have the master image and the slave image. There'll be a long track SAR processing to focus that image and get uh, much higher resolution uh, as we'd seen from the um, a long track SAR. Uh, you do a long track SAR processing. And then from these two images, they can uh, calculate out an amplitude, a phase, and you may not be able to see it, but there's these sort of interferometric, uh, looks a bit like wallpaper, right? But it's the interferometric sign with little wiggles that are associated with the, um, the features that we're wanting to see. And you can look at the coherence between these images and uh, find a coherence map. So this then uh, gives us the complex interferograms. And over the ocean, we will be downloading uh, the nine beams with uh, the interferogram uh, information, and then on the ground, we will process to do co-located heights, uh, calculate slopes if needed on the rivers, but also over the ocean, and also calculate other altimetric uh, variables such as uh, wind waves, uh, etc. And as I said, there's high-resolution data in a three-kilometer coastal band that uh, will download all of this information and you can reprocess uh, for specific, zooming in on specific uh, areas on the ground. So, um, what you'll actually receive are these gridded data along the, each swath. So, either with a one or two kilometre resolution, that's uh, still being discussed by the science team, but all the standard variables like we get with uh, standard altimetry. And the height level, sorry, the error level, has a mean of about 2.5 centimetres per kilometre squared, but it's actually lower than that in the central part of the swath, and the error increases slightly as you get to the edges of the swath. So that's something that uh, still is much lower than the error we have with a long track altimetry, but it does have this error pattern. So, um, 
This is the mask that separates the onboard processing from the, um, uh, what's downloaded in the maximum resolution, which is shown here in red. The hydrologists are not interested in water over the desert areas. That's why these areas are taken out. And uh, because of the huge data volume, we're still at one teraoctet per day, they've also taken out some of the very high um, latitude areas where we won't be getting good measurements. But essentially, all around these coastal areas, we will have both data sets, the um, onboard process 250 meter data set, plus the, um, the uh, very high resolution data set. The satellite will be launched in October 2021, and for the first six months, because it's a very new technology, they're going to spend uh, time doing calibration of the instrument, adjusting the parameters, but at the end of that six-month period, we are asking them to have at least 60 days and maybe 90 days when we're in this uh, one-day repeat. So this just shows the track, but there will, of course, be two swaths coming along. And so in all of these places, we will get passes coming over every day for 60 days at least. And so you can see there's places in the Mediterranean, in the uh, Californian current, in the Gulf Stream, Agullis, where you have crossovers, so you're getting two measurements per day. So it opens up a lot of uh, perspectives to looking at the fast temporal evolution of these small-scale ocean structures, because for this period, we will be getting a lot of information locally. The hydrologists don't like this phase at all, because they're interested in looking at the smallest lakes and the smallest rivers everywhere. So they actually asked for global coverage over a one-month period, and we negotiated. So we now have this sort of coverage um, and a 21-day repeat for the main part of the mission. So this is a um, uh, for three years from 2022 to 2025. And the ground tracks get laid down so that this is five days of ground tracks. It shifts westward. The next five days, we move in and we fill in this gap. And then there are very small uh, distances between these ground tracks that uh, the hydrologists want to fill. So the whole pattern gets shifted uh, one step over, and the next 10 days, the whole thing gets uh, filled in. So this was carefully negotiated between the two communities, who, one who wanted global coverage, the other wanted the more rapid temporal coverage. So essentially, in 10 days, we cover the globe, and then the next 10 days, we shift over and we fill in all the gaps. Um, SWAT is the first altimetric mission where the error budget is not a globally averaged value, but we're trying to meet a spectral requirement, which is here in red. And so we've asked that all of the different components are also below this minimum uh, level in uh, spectrally. And so the engineers have to build the satellite so that it's stable and it doesn't have ringing that gives us bad information at a certain frequency or a certain wavelength. And so all of these error budgets have been calculated. They're the same as a lot of altimetry, but there are specific errors for Karen in keeping the platform stable, because you can imagine if you're trying to do an interferogram and your platform is going like this, it won't work. If the platform's rolling like this, it will also give us extra errors. And it gives errors in the range, it gives errors in the phase, and all of those have been calculated and taken into account. One of the things, as I mentioned, is the uh, wave impact, and that's something that they've also done a lot of work trying to understand the impact of waves on the um, error budget. So one thing that has come up as an interesting and challenging part of the SWAT mission and, in fact, of all altimetry missions when we get down below the 100-kilometer wavelength band, is that we're starting to get a lot of dynamics that are not just balanced sea, um, sea surface height motions and balanced flow that has a geostrophic or quasi-geostrophic uh, component uh, linking velocity to sea surface height, but there's also a lot of high-frequency signals from internal tides, internal waves, that uh, we can measure now with this low noise level in this band. And so that's SWAT, if you look on, the, on Google, means um, 
A SWOT analysis is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And uh, this is potentially a threat if all we want to do is look at the balanced uh, motion for the sub scales. But it may also be an opportunity to have uh, two-dimensional uh, images to look at the interaction between these high-frequency uh, motions and the general circulation. So, as I said, um, SWOT has been chosen uh, to have an orbit that resolves the tides. I've also already mentioned this plot with the tidal errors. So we're really trying to focus on improving the tides in the coasts and the high latitude areas up to 78 degrees north and south. But the internal tides are also generated when the barotropic tide interacts with bathymetry in a stratified ocean. And uh, there's uh, internal waves that get generated at depth. You see them strongly at the thermocline with sometimes 20 to 30 metre amplitude waves. And these correspond to a very small signal in sea surface height. Today, we can detect this a little bit with a long track altimetry, but uh, with we can't look at the two-dimensional spreading out of these from the mid-ocean ridges where there's a big, strong bathymetry. You get all of these internal tides radiating out. So we'd like to verify that our models are getting these right. One thing that's interesting is the internal tides are generated. We can see that generation mechanism well. But when they propagate away, there are certain zones where they, they just disappear at the equator, in the western boundary currents, etc. And so this is the dissipation me mechanism is, um, is something that is uh, still uh, needing a lot of um, uh, work. So this is an intercomparison between HICOM, which is a model with full tides and internal tides, and also an altimetry-based analysis from a long track JSON altimetry. And you can see that uh, it's not perfect, but there, there's good um, uh, representation of internal tides in this model. And uh, there is some mix sometimes of um, internal tide energy in different boundary currents. But uh, if the amplitude is fairly well done with these models, getting the phase and the timing of these internal tides right is something that's quite uh, difficult. So I spoke about the fact that these internal tide energy just disappears at some areas. So for the preparation of SWAT, some teams have been running these, um, these uh, um, simplified models where you generate an internal tide here at the bottom, you propagate it north, and you make it pass across a zonal current with either low energy or high energy. And you can see that the internal tide interacting with a low energy current, it essentially passes through. It wobbles around a bit, but you could essentially pass a harmonic analysis and separate the different components of the internal tide here. So we call that a coherent internal tide. When you pass across a very dynamic current, like the circumpolar current or the Gulf Stream, it just shatters into millions of tiny, tiny, small anomalies. It, this gave me nightmares when I first saw this, uh, this uh, map. And so this is what they call an incoherent internal tide, meaning you can't analyze it with uh, harmonic analysis. And, uh, but it has very interesting issues of how the internal tide then dissipates because it's in much smaller structures that doesn't propagate and also how this mixes in and interacts with the instabilities. So it's going to be, uh, as I said, uh, if we want to correct for the internal tide, we're not going to be able to do it here, but if we want to study the interaction between the internal tide and the, uh, and the uh, small-scale circulation, this will be a very, very interesting tool to uh, give us observations of these phenomena. Another thing that occurs in this 1,500 kilometer wavelength band are, of course, internal gravity waves. And internal gravity waves have been studied from moorings for a long time. Uh, they exist everywhere. They're caused by wind fluctuations, uh, interactions of current with bathymetry, lots of things that generate um, instabilities, and then they propagate as internal gravity waves. Garrett and Monk predicted a theoretical internal gravity wave spectra in time, and people have projected that to look at how it works in space. And the thing is, these internal gravity waves uh, add 
energy at small scale, which kind of pumps up this part of the spectra. And this is an analysis of um, very high resolution model run from the MIT GCM in Drake Passage, where they have looked at uh, hourly averaged data here in red, compared it to daily average data, which is what a lot of modelers generally look at. And the daily average data, of course, smooths out a lot of this high frequency internal gravity waves. This is the blue line here and gives us a really nice spectral slope. When you have hourly averaged outputs of these uh, models with very high frequency forcing, you get a kick up in the spectral slope at the end. And this, of course, an altimetry measuring one snapshot will measure the ensemble of this. So as we move our, our for the moment with JSON, we can't see this effect in the um, Drake passage at all because it's blocked by the noise level. SWAT will have a level that is uh, more than an order of magnitude lower, and we will have to be addressing how we deal with this. Do we smooth it out, filter it out? Are there ways of separating these signals? And there's a lot of work in the SWAT community to do this. I'll speed up a bit. Um, one of the questions is that, as I said, the sub scales are small, but they're also fast. And so we have to have ways of... Uh, of mapping this in a way that uh, fills in the observation gaps, but as much as possible, we maintain the small scale features that we measure with our 2D images. And to help our studies in investigating this, um, we've, the SWAT team has put together a simulator that you can plug into all different types of models, ROMs, uh, HICOM, uh, uh, the NEMO model in France and Europe, and what it does is it gives you the spatial sampling of SWAT in its one-day mission, in its uh, full 21-day mission, and it also gives you the errors. So you can see locally how the SWAT sampling will come over your zone and what sort of errors would be uh, impacting uh, on average in your zone. So this is available on this uh, website. And it's been used, for example, to see if we were just going to do the most basic objective analysis what would be the impact of having um, SWOT coverage compared to NADAR altimetry coverage. So this is, for example, a model providing the truth. If we do a 21-day coverage of what SWOT would look like and just put all those images together, you can see it's a bit noisy, but that there's also these big uh, uh, discontinuities, and so you can't just put the data together. Um, if you map it, using a standard objective analysis. You can reconstruct this time step with this sort of scene. And if you took the equivalent measurements from uh, a series of JSON altimeters and mapped it, you would get this in sea surface height. So the major features are there. This is what we see with the large scale sea surface height with a viso anyway. But when you look at the details, there's a lot of anisotropy and, and structure in the mapped data and the truth that is missing from the Aviso style mapping. And uh, if you calculate currents, you can see that there's a big difference then between the smooth sea surface height giving us smooth currents yeah. and these uh, very uh, anisotropic structures that give us much more realistic currents. If we go to relative vorticity, the gradient of that, it's even more striking. So. I mentioned yesterday, I won't spend much time on this, there are techniques to try and interpolate between uh, these uh, uh, snapshot images using a simple dynamical model with a uh, one and a half layer uh, QG that um, conserves potential vorticity. And the difference between uh, the truth between these uh, days at day 14, day 21, reconstructing in the center, uh, the truth, using uh, normal OI uh, or using this dynamical model helps uh, move these uh, features in a more dynamical way in between, uh, in between the two uh, snapshots. And this is just another example with a small eddy here that moves northward and after two days, after four days, Linear interpolation or no eye will just do the mean of these divided by two. So you actually get two eddies 
some weak eddies in your final map, whereas a dynamical model will tend to advect this one, and it tends to advect this one as well, with much lower error levels. People are also trying to see how you might take that information at very high resolution and reconstruct the uh, three-dimensional circulation, and this is work uh, using surface quasi-geostrophy uh, and linking it to very high resolution sea surface height as we would have from SWOT, projecting it using surface quasi-geostrophy theory, and then this is the vertical velocity at 40 meters from the original model, and this is what happens if you do this sort of projection using um, SQG and uh, a very detailed uh, sea surface height, which takes into account the eddy turbulence in the surface layer. And they've also done versions where they add in like a mixed layer using surface winds and surface temperature, which gives a better reconstruction in this case. But it's something that uh, people are actively looking at, how we might use a combination of different uh, satellite observations to try and help reconstruct part of the upper ocean. Probably uh, the most rigorous way to reconstruct is to put it in a full data assimilation scheme. And the Mercator group, uh, Pierre-Yves mentioned this, are looking at already testing how they might ingest SWOT data into their operational system. There's a question about the large data volume, but it's also a question of how very high resolution information at one time step might then propagate through the system and perturb the system or constrain the system. So they've been running this for a while using um, OSSEs. This is the error variance over a whole year uh, with no assimilation, assimilating uh, three altimetry along track uh, system and the difference in the reduction of errors, assimilating one SWAT mission with its uh, standard sampling in the nominal three-year phase and a combination of the two. So there's a, a strong reduction from using SWOT. And one of the interesting things about that is when you put in a NADAR altimeter measurement that cuts across particular features, it's cutting across the sides of eddies, perhaps the center of eddies, the sides of meanders. It may match that up with an existing meander and strengthen it but it may also just put that in as sort of like small, isolated, coherent eddies that propagate through the system until the next observation point that corrects them. And so SWOT, by putting in the full two-dimensional image, it's putting in all of the ionisotropy locally, it's putting in the strain, it's putting in the stir, the result of all that is being uh, entered in, and so it actually slightly reduces the mesoscale energy, but it's putting movement in the right place into the model. And so that's perhaps one of the reasons why the SWOT images work so well for the data assimilation. Other things that are being explored because of the large data volume is that you can perhaps use um, not all of the SWOT information, which uh, is not necessarily independent, but look at uh, the dominant uh, uh, controlling structures, and so, for example, from the surface height and the surface current fields, derive uh, Lipanov exponents, and then uh, try and assimilate the position of these uh, stretching and straining um, uh, key areas to the flow, and also uh, testing that or assimilating as well the horizontal gradients of, um, of SST. So this is work that's being explored. There's, in the SWAT community, there are a lot of different ways that are being explored to try and see how we're best going to uh, interpolate into these um, temporal gaps. And one of the final points I'd like, just like to make is that SWAT is not going to exist alone, and the combination of information that you get from the mix layer, from SST, from uh, changes of uh, surface roughness, that you might get from SAR or sun glitter across particular structures, combined with the sea surface height across fronts is something that will give us a lot of, uh, or chlorophyll, gives us a lot of information about these fine scale structures. But to recall, altimetry gives us what's going to be important from the surface to greater depths. And there is this, uh, this um, complementary information about what you get from the very, very fine structures right in the surface layer. So I haven't spoken about other issues, 
but like all altimeters, it can be used to improve the marine geoid. Three years of data, we will have a big improvement in our estimate of the marine geoid and eventually ocean bathymetry, and there are people working on that. And also, one of the key issues is not sea ice coverage, that we do reasonably well now, but sea ice thickness. And you can get sea ice thickness by measuring the topography of the ocean, the topography of the sea ice, and looking at the difference that gives you what they call freeboard. And so that's also something that um, technically, when we're looking at four degrees angle, we're not 100% sure it's going to work, but it's, we'll have maybe some demonstration sites for that. So I will finish there, just to reinforce the fact that for the first time we're going to have 2D images, so it's a completely different ballpark than what we've done for the last 30 years with altimetry. Um, it's going to combine with in-situ observations, other satellite observations and model, give us a much better idea, we hope, of uh, the interaction between the meso and the small mesoscale that we're missing today and the sub-mesoscale, but also generation dissipation mechanisms that we're not getting a good handle on with altimetry today. Um, very important for coastal studies and for coastal and high latitude internal tide studies. We need to better understand uh, the interactions with the surface roughness field, and there are studies with groups that are working on that. I haven't spoken specifically about that. And there's a lot of scientific interest uh, and uh, movement to prepare for SWOT in trying to understand this link between balanced motions in the ocean and uh, the internal wave, the internal tide field. And so at the next AGU, we have a couple of sessions that will be treating that, and uh, it's one of the big uh, key issues. So thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry.